Hey, what's up you two? Welcome to this uh, new video on YouTube. Back to EU4. Uh, we're still here in 1.28.3, the Spain update, um, in 2019. Still a few months away from the European update, but here we did a Russia run. It's my third one, I think. Well, if I ignore the... Um, 1600 points village thing that I did that I use Russia for, but in terms of actual Russian runs, that's my third one. I did one that was aimed at reaching 3000 force limit, like uh, two years ago. That ended up being a revolutionary Russia with quantity ideas. And then not long ago, a few months ago, I did a Russian run again, where I reached the maximum number of states, which is not a revolutionary, because the age thing in the revolution, age of revolutions gives Russia a 20 state bonus, but it's only available for Imperial Russia not for revolutionary Russia. So, yeah. Uh, so I'm basically doing the same thing here, give or take. The ideas are a bit different, and what we actually did to conquer stuff is a bit different as well. Main thing is that that last video where we did the max state uh, thing, uh, we didn't go for... I, I stopped in about 17 to winning when the game got boring. This one, I pushed it to the end. That's why we have this here. So I'll go through those details. But first, we'll go through the timeline. So, first the timeline, the main, the main strategy here, and it's really available for all of Mo for all of Russian, if you play Muscovy, anything that's going to become a Tsardom. A so for those who don't know, this Tsardom is something from Third Rome, from the DLC Third Rome, it affects basically anything that's Orthodox, really, in Russia. And anything that can form Russia is usually a princedom, which is a duchy level. Uh, that has one extra state and some other modifiers. But the main thing is that you're stuck as a duchy. There's no kingdom rank. You are a duchy until you can form Russia at tech 10. And then whatever you have, the provinces are required for it. And if you can, once you form Russia, you become a Tsardom and an empire automatically. You skip the, skip the kingdom rank. It has a massive effect on states because all of this is a lot of low dev stuff. So you end up having a lot of states usually. Uh, by example, Muscovy, which is this size, only has one extra state that it can add. Granted, they have a lot of land that is already stated, like all of this is already in the state they have, these two subjects are already in the state they have, there's a bunch of stuff in Kazan and Lithuania and all that. And obviously Novgorod. But that's the main thing, say, until take 8, where you get 3 states, um, you don't have any more states other than the states you have at the start, and then you're not gonna get Kingdom rank once you reach 200 development. So the big thing uh, early game is to try to, well, expand mostly within your territories so that you don't get too many territories for corruption and then get the other states in the other way. So the main thing is my first idea group is admin now when I play Muscovy. Uh, you'd usually go for religious to convert stuff, but um, it's not that necessary. It's a few more rebels, obviously, but and you don't have Holy War. But the Holy War is not exactly relevant because early game you're going to have claims everywhere like in the steppes in Lithuania and even some of Sweden and all that. But it's not exactly relevant. You just can go by those states. Um, so I'm not going through the details here. But the main important thing, you have the two subjects, Yaroslav and the other guy here. And I don't remember the name. Um, these are the two first subjects you need to annex because if you look into state... I can click this, it's going to start the timeline, but if you look yourself at the start, these are already in a, an actual state that's already stated. So you should annex those already. It will automatically become states without having to pay for it. Um, another thing too is when you conquer stuff, if you take just one province from stuff that your subjects already have those states, give it to your subjects instead of paying for full territory. A good example is when you take Luki from uh, Novgorod. It's in the Psov state with Polotsk here, so all of this is one state. So Psov already have that state, give them Luki on top of that Luki as a fort, so you don't pay for a fort. Um, another example is Perm. Perm doesn't start with this, you have it, but the whole state of Perm is this, so why not give them that instead until you annex Perm. Uh, Perm needs to be annexed uh, a bit before you f get form Russia, because once you form Russia, if your ideas are on time, you'll end up being able to start your Siberian Frontier, and then you need to be bordering this. So, another thing about the Siberian Frontier, uh, you should be focusing on trying to get this part here. 
How you do this is first of all, you'll need one of those three provinces. So this one is these two, two three provinces, which is the Tamba of State, is shared between Kazan and the Golden Horde, the Great Horde at the start. You need at least one of those provinces. Obviously, you might want all three because you're going to have to state it too. The reason being is to start your missions to go east, which the first mission is Tame the Steps. The requirement is that you have converted one of those two provinces to Orthodox. Uh, if you don't take religious first, as in this plan I'm plan talking about, you you still can convert them, but you'll need first to state it to remove the church and penalty, and then put the um, religious unity edict in that state, and then you're good to go. You can unstate it after; it's not a good state. There's only three provinces, but like you, you'll need to state it at least temporarily to do that. Once you convert it at least one province, then you'll start getting your missions to go into Kazan and the Golden Horde first, and then eventually goes back. And that's the big thing. Once you get your claims on this, you need this. You, you need to take at least like down to Omsk and then everything that borders this. And the reason is, if all you do by the time you did the you do Sabrin Frontier is an next sperm, all you're going to be able to do until as soon as you form Russia is take those two. And then you'll have to wait for these to finish. And then when this is finished, you'll be able to do those two. And then you'll be able to do those three and then these, this one, and then he, you'll be able to go forward. If you take Sibir, as soon as you form Russia, assuming you have your Siberian frontier idea, national idea, you'll be able to do all of this in one go. It's going to save you roughly 30 years. Especially important if you're trying to do the uh, relentless push east achievement, which is as Russia reached Pacific by 1600. It's pretty much guaranteed that you won't be able to get there in time if you just do perm. So try to get this. So it's a lot easier if Timurus falls apart, obviously, because often they'll ally each other since they're the same culture. But yeah, look into that. Other than that, uh, you might want to keep an eye on Poland and get the small state and well, whatever here, like these two are in the territory you have. And don't go too crazy on this, it's not relevant. Um, unless Poland is weak, either they don't get Lithuania in the PU by the event, or if Poland falls behind in tech, they usually do. Um, another thing you might check, but this can be dangerous, is Crimea before oh, the Ottomans gets an event to maybe get them as a marsh. So, but the thing is, if it happens while you're at war with Crimea, the war doesn't cancel out. It's just the Ottomans becomes the leader, and then you're fighting the Ottomans. But on the other end, you might try to out like outpace that and get at least part not this but like i'm talking actual crimea part of crimea before it turns under the ottomans then pay attention to that event eventually uh, it's it happens when the ruler of crimea dies so if you're not sure if it happened if you don't have to pop up or whatever just look at the ruler um i think his name is Anz or ani some it's h something the starting ruler say in the comment if you remember what name it is that's another thing to do otherwise no need to rush anything. In Sweden, you'll need Viborg eventually because it's in Russia. Your mission, you have a, you have a mission to conquer over the Russian region. This is in Russia. But as long as it's under Denmark, it's not exactly relevant. One trick you can do is eventually Sweden will become unloyal. You support our independence. Automatically, Sweden's probably going to declare on, the, on Denmark. And as once you are guaranteed that Sweden's going to win, then peace out, separate peace, and break the alliance. So that Sweden doesn't have time to get a good line swept. They're pretty isolated, so usually they won't get anything. Uh, but yeah, you'll also need eventually this. So if you're supporting Sweden, make sure that before they declare the war that you have interest on this. Um, yeah. Also, going just for every Borg, I usually don't do it because if you do it properly, you'll also get events on a uh, mission. A mission on all of Finland, and then you can take all of this in one go. Like all of this is mission. You'll see that I'll push low with B, I'll go to that when I get there, but I'll eventually move my trade capital to the Baltic Sea. Okay. So you'll see me take Uzbek pretty soon, and then we'll form Russia a few years later. The only time that I went into corruption rank and level for extra territories is when I took this so that I could be ready for the frontier. But then I did Russia like a few years later. And then once you form Russia, you get like 15 more states out of nowhere because you become an empire plus the Tsardom has extra states. 
as you can see we didn't do anything. Now, the reason why my frontier is not done yet as I fought Russia is because my rulers were crap, so eventually I ended up being behind in ideas. Um, so my idea groups, my first idea groups were admin and trade, they were not, like, rushed out, so I could stay on tech a bit, because I needed tech 10 to form Russia. But because of that, Seven Frontier is the third idea, so I didn't have it when I formed Russia, so you might have a better run if you don't have crappy rulers. Another thing too is I don't I don't develop with Russia for institutions. I wait the, for them to to come to me. Usually I will ally Bohemia, but Bohemia was allied to Poland. That made it difficult, but allying Bohemia, Bohemia is in the center of everything for the early ones, a bit late for the Renaissance. Um, and colonialism you can't do anything about really. But they are in Germany, so they might get it too. So, yeah, if you take care of your economy, they might sell it to you. That's what I was trying to say. But then, here we go. We got our ideas going. And then we'll go. They didn't, the Ottomans didn't get Crimea. They actually fought them for this. You'll see that we'll, we did fight fought the Commonwealth a bit, just finishing a few states here. But then uh, we'll start going crazy. This is just colonization, so I don't care. We didn't go for Transoxiana, even though we had, well, just did. But they were allied to the Ottomans for a long time. And I didn't want to fight the Ottomans for it without taking anything from the Ottomans. No like fighting big uh, big powers without weakening them. So yeah, I'm just gonna focus on the here because I'm not gonna do anything in Asia for a long time. Because this is China. All of this is China. And then the Ottomans are here. But eventually I'll start pushing. I'll fight the Ottomans to get them out of Crimea. And then I'll break the alliance with Transoxiana, and that's going to open me. So, as I said, I took trade second, and that's... With as many Russian runs I did, the best way to do to make money with Russia is to go trade ideas as early as possible. And the reason is, trade ideas is extremely strong if you're trading inland. So our power, like you know, you all know pretty, probably that the way you get power in coastal nodes is to put ships to protect trade there. But how does it work in land since you can put land, put ships on an inland node? Uh, it works, It can. It, your power is calculated based on the development you have upstream from that node, assuming you have a merchant transferring from that node. Good example, by example, is Samarkand. Samarkand is here, roughly. So, until you have no land, you'll have zero power here, because you have your base power is based on the development you have in the node itself. That works in like in any node. But you also get power in land in unland nodes when you have land upstream. Once you put a merchant to transfer upstream. So once I put a merchant in Samarkand to trade up in Astrakhan, then my all my development that I have upstream. So in Astrakhan and then in Kazan, everything that's upstream from here will be calculated and then that portion of that I think is a fork something that turns into power in the node plus the power you have from the land you have in the node plus all modifiers also trade ideas so that the point of trade ideas is it gives you more merchants that you can put there because you need a merchant there for the land net development upstream to be affecting the node on top of that the last idea of trade is caravan power caravan power is a multiplier of that upstream development so trade is extremely powerful in Russia once you have expanded. So there's a lot of nodes that you'll have to like you have to micromanage your traders because your merchants because there's a lot of nodes that eventually you don't need to put a merchant in. The, the first will be Kazan because Kazan only has one exit, which is Novgorod. So once you have all the land in Kazan, nobody nobody's going to be collecting here, and anybody that wants to put a merchant there for some reason is going to pull to Novgorod anyways. So you don't need a merchant here, so they're all going to go to Novgorod on its own once all land here is yours. Siberia is a bit tricky because it goes to Kazan, but it also goes to Samarkand. So until you control all of, all of Samarkand, it's going to, if you don't put a merchant in Siberia, it's going to cut in half. So you could put a merchant here just to guarantee that to, it goes to Kazan. And once you have all of Samarkand, it's irrelevant. Um, Astrakhan goes to Crimea and Kiev. So again, keep an eye on it uh, until you control all of, all of Crimea. Uh, Samarkand only goes to Astrakhan, so that's one that you eventually don't need to put a merchant in. No, actually, sorry, it goes to Persia too. Um, as you'll see, I'm not going to Persia whatsoever. I'll have this province for a bit, but I'll sell it to Mazandran eventually because I don't want to spend the territory for one single province. 
Um, and I'm not going to Persia. The reason is Persia can only go to Aleppo and then Aleppo to Constantinople. Ragusa, there's no way basically to pull it up. So it can stay there. And the same reason why I want to... Gujarat will be my subject, but I'm not going to take land here. I'll have land a bit, but eventually you'll sell, sell it all to him. Reason is Gujarat, same thing with Deccan and Coromandel, can only go to Persia and then the same path as I explained in a minute, a minute ago. So it goes to Ormuz, Basra, Persia. Basra, Basra goes to Aleppo directly. So there's no way to pull it up. So Astrakhan is basically a choke point. It can go to Persia and can go up, but this is the only way you can push it in. So I was really aiming on Persia, uh, on, uh, sorry, I was really aiming on trade here, like all my expansions were going area by area in uh, nodes that I can pull. So before going to Lahore, I was making that I had good control with Samarkand, then before going to Doab, good control on Lahore, etc, etc. Same thing here, there's the human tra trade node that I didn't touch for a while because it was all tributaries of me, but if you want to push Beijing properly, you'll have to control human. So even Beijing is big, you and this is crap usually, it's still more useful to get this first, otherwise you'll never be able to pull the trade. So right now, I think we're pushing hard here while doing nothing here. Yeah, so I'm, I'm thinking here, planning eventually to go to Baltic Sea as my main trade node, but we're not gonna there be there yet. We're gonna take care of the you know, Enrica soon. So I'm pushing here in Afghanistan for a bit. Oh yeah, I did take this because for a second the Orat removed the tributary and Ming attacked them. Well, for tributary, for those who don't know, while Ming is fighting for to make someone a tributary. Well, obviously they are not a tributary during that war, so it means you can attack them. And even if Ming ends the war and makes them a tributary before the end of the war, before the end of your war, Ming is not going to be called in. Because tributary status can only be called at the declaration of war, not later on, unlike allies. So we took it, took time, like we took this opportunity to push in here. Uh, eventually, okay, yeah, we're pushing here pretty hard. Uh, we're going to push eventually, like, there's the crack of node here that is not exactly relevant until you can control the Baltic Sea. That's why I moved to the Baltic Sea. There was a lot of money in the Baltic Sea, but also Krakow can pull to the Baltic Sea, but not to Novgorod. So I wanted to control the Baltic Sea, and then that means I can also add the crack of node. No point in pushing more west unless I want to go to Lubeck. Like, my plan was to either go super big east or super big west, and that's basically the cutting point. If you're going to go east, like, focus your trade on the east, then the Baltic Sea and Krakow are pretty good, but then there's no point going further. But if you go west, and you push Lubeck, and then eventually maybe even the English Channel, even if you just go to Lubeck, then most of Germany can be pulled to Lubeck. So, all of this can't be pulled to the box of the Baltic Sea. Like, not even this. Like, Constantinople. Constantinople only goes to Venice. Ragusa can be pulled to Vienna. So if you go to Lübeck, because Vienna then can be pulled to uh, Saxony, and then Saxony to Lübeck. I mean, Vienna to Saxony to Lübeck. And if you have Vienna, um, then you can get Ragusa as well. So... That opens up all of this that I didn't take. And Ragusa is basically all of Greece, which there's an orthodox stuff here. And then from there, you will have uh, this node that I remember, don't remember the name. And then Evans opens up Champagne, which can be uh, pulled up to the English Channel. If you get the English Channel, English Channel opens up all of this. You'll also have the North Sea, which then means you can pull out, push out Denmark over here, because that's North Sea. So yeah. That's a good strategy too, to get proper trade here. But then you'll also have all of Europe, so at that point your money is not going to matter. If you go east otherwise, there's no point in pushing for Lubeck. Lubeck only goes to the English Channel. I'm talking like if you're focusing on trade, obviously. Um, so the best if you go east would be to, get, to push west to the Baltic Sea and Krakow, because Krakow can be pulled up, but then after that it's pointless. Everything else only goes to Lubeck 
or the channel. Once you go east, don't care about Persia, get Astrakhan, uh, get, Astrakhan get Samarkand, then you get Lahore, then you get Doab, and then you get Bengal. Bengal will be considered an inland node. Also, small parenthesis about the inland trading that I was talking about earlier. A node will call be considered to be inland for the purpose of calculating power if it's actually inland. Or if it's a coastal node that you put a merchant in and pull towards inland. A good example is Bengal. Bengal is coastal, obviously, so you can protect it with ships. But it can also be considered inland. Um, if you're pulling inland to Doab, by example. So if you put a merchant here that pulls to Doab, then Bengal will be considered both inland and coastal for the purpose of power calculation. And then here, all of Indonesia goes to Bengal. And then from Bengal, you can pull it up. And then all of China, well, Beijing goes to Yumen, and then Yumen goes to Siberia and all that. And then everything else in China can be pulled either through Canton to Yanzhou to Beijing or straight up to Beijing. And this one goes to Yumen. And then here you have Siberia and you have Kirin and Nippon. Uh, Nippon can be pulled to Canton and then up again and Girin can go, go straight to Siberia. So that's all the stuff you can take in order. There's no point in getting to Bengal before you get the web, by example. So once we're done with this, we're rushing this because we can't exactly touch main right now. They have like 600 force limit. I'm at 300-ish. So we're going to clean this up. I'm going to push this out. You'll see Prussia will be pretty big. We'll take this from him still. Denzig is my vassal at this point. I deploy vassalized him in one province and then fed him his course back. Eat him. Push Celestia is going to eat this. We're going to take this. We were allied for Hungary for a long time. My dynasty is actually Uniad. But he never fell under a PU, so. Eventually, I broke off and took this stuff so I can open my missions. We're going to take this. This is the only portion of my empire that has no purpose in trade because it's in Constantinople. But we did it for mission because you have a mission to get Bulgaria and Thrace. And then it gives you a massive modifier on development. For your capital, which I used to push the capital to 50 for the last age bonus. So this is pretty much my border in Europe. Besides this, I don't I won't even take Awalakia. We took this here because it's in Crimea. This is my vassal. I'll eat him soon enough. This is in Crimea. The Crimea node is a bit weird. Uh, but that's gonna be pretty much it in Europe. We'll take this eventually again to push into the Baltic Sea, and then everything else will be in, in the east. Yeah, we took this. This is pretty much done. This is pretty much done. I don't remember the order of things. Okay, we eat Emirati here. We took this. Yeah, we're pretty much done here. Yeah, we're, we're actually really done here. A note here, this is actually ours. It's just that Stockholm always stays blue for some reason in the timeline. Then we're going to push the whole army east, push a lot in India eventually, this is going to be too much of this expansion, so we're going to, the way we went for China, the way I break China usually, and it usually works, tributaries don't have a penalty, they can be diplomatized by others and there's no penalty to it even if they are tributary. So the way to do it usually is to diplomatize one of their tributary that touches you and touches them. And we did it for Mongolia here. So Mongolia touches me here, but also touches me. The reason for this is once they're vassalized and then you did, you annex them 10 years later, then it means that this becomes yours, and that means you touch me, and then all your development counts towards the mandate of me, which will make them melt pretty fast, and then it, they become easy to fight. <clears throat> so here starts the dismantling of Ming. Pretty hard here. Kalka is my vassal. Yeah, at this point it's just expansion, expansion. Eventually I'll be drowning in money, so what I'm gonna do is spend all my money on conscription centers, uh, the upgraded barrack version, and all furnaces, obviously. And the reason 
I didn't need those troops. The reason first I wanted to beat the video I was talking in the, in the beginning, where I reached 2,000 force limit. I reached 3,700 uh, 3, ish, ish in this build. Now again, like I'm not gonna touch this. I did fight Malwa for this to complete the Doab node, and then as you'll see soon enough, this and this are subjects of mine. I'm gonna beat up Bengal, beat up Ishpa, Shipa. I'm gonna push Spain out of here. And then clear the rest. A lot of this were threats, like all these one single province taken by random people. This one in Genoa and this one in the Netherlands won't be able to take it because at this point all of Europe is allied with each other and guaranteeing the small guys. So I didn't feel like fighting all this for one uh, for one province. We would have won, but it's just annoying for no reason. So there it is. All basically clean con conquests and for trade. There's already these two missing, and then I have all the the provinces in the nodes I'm interested in. With more time, we would have pushed into Japan. The reason Japan is still here, I don't have a fleet in the Pacific. They didn't feel like building one. We pull here. Malacca is a huge trade node that we can be pulled to Bengal and then up. But this one needs protection because that would be coastal to coastal. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, so. Just to look at the stats. So in terms of that video I was talking about, I reached 3000 and we were talking quantity ideas with revolutionaries. So that's 90% increased force limit from ideas. We don't have quantity ideas here. I'll go through that in a minute. And we are not revolutionary, obviously. Now the revolutionary force limit, I don't know how you'd calculate that. Because if you go revolutionary, you'll get the 40 plus, plus the maintenance and all that. But you're not going to get the extra 20 states from the last stage for Russia. So, and those states, those extra states will be more force limit, especially if you build buildings in it. So I don't know how it would calculate. Um, but yeah, we have way more force limit there without quantity ideas. If we took quantity ideas with this, we'd probably have 5k, so easy. We have conscription centers in every building, even in every province, even territories. Uh, all our trade companies have the plus 10, the plus 5 force limit. Uh, all trade companies, every single area of all the investments, being taxes, production, manpower. Uh, we have 1.5-ish million manpower. It's not full yet because I wanted to reach this to, to show that it can be paid for. And that means I, I need a lot of manpower to hire those troops. At this, with this force limit, just a side note, it's, uh, the Strelsky button spawns 100, 750,000 Strelskys. This is more like 2.5 million, just there's an integer error here because the number is too high. That's just funny like that. Uh, no cavalry. As I said, once I reach tech 13, I remove all cavalry. That leads me into what ideas we took here. Uh, Russia has the best cannons in the game because of one national idea that I can't show here, but it's the fourth idea. It makes archery cost cheaper and gives 10% compatibility for artillery. So if you take quality on top of it, plus the horse artillery policy, it's 30%. On top of that, your infantry is Strelsky's, Strelsky's is 10% fire. So it leads into a situation where you are heavily specialized into fire damage. Cavalry don't do that much fire damage. So I, rem I decided to move all cavalry out and focus everything on fire damage. Up to the point where I reach 100 professionalism to have generals cost half meaning that whenever I would drown into military points instead of developing, because the larger you are, the less developing matters, because it's one point out of a lot more development. So one plus one point out of 200 development is a lot more, I worth a lot more than one point out of 7,000. So instead, all I do is spam generals on tick until I get four plus fire pips, ignoring shock pips, because my troops don't really do shock damage. So. So we want admin trade, as I explained, to admin to get states in the early game before we form Russia, so that I can have more space, it's 10 more areas to expand without going to corruption, then trade for everything I explained about trade. And then we went into quality, that's the one we get once we form Russia. Um, the order is important too, so admin, trade, uh, admin, diplo, 
and military. I always take, that's a trick I use in the, almost all my runs. I will always focus on military, but only take my military idea group third. No, not only worse than single player, obviously. But the idea is that we're going to drown in military points. And with those military points, we're going to hire generals. First, it, by just rolling more, you're going to get better generals out of RNG eventually rolling in your favor. But on top of that, every time you hire a general, it's one professionalism. So I don't drill my troops. Um, but my professionalism gets to 100, about 1550, 1600 if I don't have, need to slack in. And we're Russia, so we don't need to slack in. So that's why we take military idea group third while focusing on military. Um, just to push our professionalism up, especially since we're not... We're not going to run out of, man, out of man parts. We don't need mercenaries because we don't need mercenaries. Professionalism is going to also make our troops better. So quality, why quality? Because archery, uh, for because of the archery thing I was explaining a minute ago. Then we take religious. You'll need religious as an orthodox nation. It just works too well with the religion. We didn't take it earlier because we take admin first for what I explained, but we take it forward because at this point you'll be big enough that you'll reach a point where you're going to have rebels after rebels after rebels to a point where it's not manageable or really tedious. So this is going to fix it. Also, since it would be different if we went, if we went for the Europe thing, we could probably push here and get all the holy sites because most are here except Rome. Also the Pentarchy and all that. At that point, you'd have more missionaries, so religious ideas would be less relevant. But since I knew I wasn't going there, I knew I'd be stuck with three. So the base one plus Defender of the Faith plus the one from Religious. Also, Religious would trade as a missionary strength edict, uh, policy. Yeah, policy. When we took Economic, that's a bit questionable. I, take, I took Economic because at this point, if I wanted to build all my force limit, I was struggling with money. So I went economy for money, uh, mo mostly. Also reducing the land maintenance, my land maintenance because my maintenance was getting pretty high because of using so many cannons. Um, but the, another good one, and basically that was the plan early before I changed that, was to go expansion here. The reason expansion has five states. Um, it also has an extra merchant for the reason I explained with inland trading. It has 20% global trade, our, most, our income for most of the game until the late game where production catches up because of coal. But for most of the game, our main source income was trade. So expansion helps with trade, also gives you states. Also, if you reach Alaska, now I didn't. The reason being, I did my push east so, so fast that by the time you have a mission eventually when you get to Siberia. You have a mission that gives you an explorer and then you can use it here with three ships to just explore but i pushed so fast that i didn't have range to reach alaska and then the explorer died so a little trick to learn from this if you're doing this fast you might want to wait on that mission to get your explorer at the point where you have the range to discover alaska because you're not taking exploration that's the only explorer you're gonna get so yeah um, but since we didn't discover Alaska, our colonists were pointless. But the colonists from expansion would be helping to get Alaska. You have a mission for that anyways. But I did want a colonist. I put one in Constantinople and what one in St. Petersburg for most of the game and just let them get some like pass, uh, passive development. It's really worthless, but whatever. I had them. I didn't take it for the colonists. And then we took offensive. Offensive just because of synergies with uh, policies, because of economic, would get... Uh, the compatibility with cannons, with horse artillery. Um, I pretty much it. Force limit, not exactly relevant. It's also uh, good with quality. Quality gives you some tradition. And once you reach a certain point of tradition, you're better off just getting flat bonuses to your generals to get better generals, rather than building up more tradition. Of course, tradition gives more than just uh, general stats. Um, yeah, that's pretty much why we took ex offensive or we due for a military idea group anyways, then expansion for what I explained, and then last I just took diplomatic at this point, it, matter, it doesn't matter, there's like 30 years left in the game. The main point was that I wanted to rush as fast as I can to finish what I wanted to get before the end of the, the, the run, and diplomatic gives you uh, war score reduction. And that's pretty much it. We got all, all tech, all ideas, professionalism is capped, which I can show here, but it is. Um, everything scored, 
have 3700 force limit, 1.5 million uh, manpower. We have everything paid for with this force limit. We're still making around 800 gold ducat a month. Uh, our ships are not built though, but there's that. And we're first in score for those who care. That's pretty much it. Pretty strong run. Uh, the key here is trade, really. Trade early. Trade ideas early so that you can actually make money and expand and buy trade nodes. Like before pushing into it as the next trade node, make sure that those upstream are controlled by you. And then trade ideas for that purpose and merchants, and that's where you're gonna make money as well. And then you can pay all the troops you can you wanna get. Um yeah. You're not gonna get that force limit, you're gonna get around two thousand naturally. The reason we have so much is by the end of the game I had I was sitting on five thousand gut ducats just for the lulls and finishing the run. I decided to build all conscription centers which just skyrocketed everything but there you go thanks for watching guys if you enjoyed the content don't forget to subscribe as well as a comment in the video well like the video of course like the video and subscribe go ahead do it now and don't forget to comment if you have any idea like any questions about the run anything that you think we could have done better or if you have any ideas for the next run and don't forget also to follow on twitch if you're interested to watch me live that's where most of my content is and that's going to be it, guys. Thanks for watching. Have a good one. Bye-bye.